All right, so for today, uh, we're going to start to segue into <coughs> creating something uh, tangible. We spent the last three days talking about concepts of the, of the code and such, frameworks and such. Let's spend some time uh, to plan about the project that we're going to create in the class, the project that we're going to create from now and, and work on it till the end of the three-month course. As I've said previously, you can decide to create an app based on your own great idea or whatever, uh, but so that we're all on the same page, we're all going to go toward creating a specific app. We're going to talk about various features of it that you could use for your own apps. And I'm going to say that as we learn more of this technology, more of these frameworks and bits and pieces and such, you will be able to accomplish a lot of things, but I have to say honestly early on, you're not going to make the next Facebook even in three months of this class. You're not going to make the next Instagram. You're not going to make the next great, you know, million dollar app, possibly. I'm not trying to dissuade you, but I'm trying to say realistically in the time that we have here, three months of like 12 class meetings, three and a half, seven hours per week, uh, that would be the drop in the bucket, a drop in the bucket of a big kind of app like Instagram, Tumblr, uh, you know, all of these kinds of big apps because those big apps often also rely on a lot of back-end meaning uh, cloud infrastructure we will be talking about that we will not be doing very much of it because that's the investment of it you can get the code for free the frameworks for free a developers account for free you can publish your apps for free and make money off of them you can do a lot of it for free the part that's not free is how does your device talk to someone else how does your device back itself up so when they go from the Moto E to the Moto G, how does it follow to the next device? How do you set it up so that uh, I need to restore a, a user account and create a login and all of that? That is an infrastructure. Uh, that's a server infrastructure. That's not free. That's going to cost a variety of prices. It would be nothing at all to be like $100 a month to have this kind of infrastructure. So we'll be talking about it. But I do have to temper, again, your expectations. People sometimes come to this class and say they have this amazing idea. Someone told me, I want to create an app that it's like, um, kind of like, um, what's the way to say it? Uh, he said it like, um, this is an app where it's going to be like the next generation of ice cream men. What's going to happen is every ice cream man in his uh, truck is going to have my app. They're all going to see each other on a map. They're all going to communicate with each other. The kids are going to download the app as well. They're going to see where the ice cream man is and, you know, call him. It's kind of like the Uber for ice cream, kind of. I said, that's a really good idea. From the three months that you spent in this class, you don't have the technology and the knowledge to create that app. You have a few years of knowledge to get to that point. Because, again, you need a lot for that to work. The code and the concepts that we'll learn here will be able to create one aspect of that. But the aspect that is missing is that whole interactivity with multiple clients and all of that, and that's going to be server stuff. And really, if we had a part four of the class, possibly we could get into that. But these classes always go down lower and lower and lower in attendance. Remember day one, I had to turn away like 10 people? Now we have spaces for everyone. One space left in the back. So it, I'm not trying to put you down, but eventually some of you are not going to come back. And I, I'm not mad at you. You can't come back, you can't come back. But uh, these classes are based on attendance. So to have a part four and seven people show up, the class is canceled day two because we need to have you know, about 15 to 20 people every class meeting for the class to be viable. But enough negativity. The positivity, yes. So we're all be here for the three months as I shouldn't say that, no. Uh, it's a long process to approve classes and all of that. And in my experience in the years of teaching it, we end up with like 10 people on a good day on the third month. And that's already below the threshold of a, you know, of a, of a viable class. So uh, to be positive about what we're going to create, again, Let's look at the example because this is what we're going to base ourselves on. Let's do this. Go ahead and open up your web browser. I'm going to open Google Chrome. Let's do it this way. Go ahead and open Google Chrome, just so that we're all looking at the exact same thing. 
when you open up Chrome, hit F12 on the keyboard. This brings up the developer's console. We've seen that a bit before. We'll see a lot more. But Google Chrome, we'll look at a variety of what these tabs do a little later. And it has here the second icon, Toggle Device Toolbar. It has a very basic mobile device emulator built in, Google Chrome. Firefox has a version of it too. So go ahead and click that button. First press F12 to pull that panel up. And then press that second button, Toggle Device Toolbar. This will then... What's that? Are you in Google Chrome? So here, um, it then changes it to what it calls responsive mode, and it makes it look like a tall, thin, sort of like tablet size. Oh, look at that. And I have a little, I don't have a mouse pointer anymore. I have a finger. I have the tip of a finger. At the top, it says I'm in responsive mode. Click up there and switch to emulating a Galaxy phone, an iPhone, an iPad. This is obviously a far cry from a real Galaxy device or a real iPad. But here, at least I can kind of see what is it, what does this website look like if someone were to visit it with, with a device. So, you know clicking around, I can scroll around, I can open up other websites, google.com for example. So it's kind of pulling it up as a, look at this, I have it as an iPhone and it says, it's better in the app, Google app is easier, get it for iPad. So it's being fooled into thinking I've got a device. So whichever of these that you choose, I'll put it just back on the top one, Galaxy 5, whichever of these that you choose, Go to the address vmcampus.com slash sdce. vmcampus.com slash sdce. We've seen this before. Notice uh, it thinks we're on a mobile device, so it took us directly to the mobile friendly version of uh, the website. If, of course, I go to it on a non mobile mode, it'll think I'm on the desktop, and so it'll take me to the desktop version. This is the project that we're going to work toward. I'm going to break it down what this is so that we have a plan about what we're going to create, then we're going to start to code and create this. Learn all the nuances about how this is built. This will be for part one. For part two then, we will then create the app version of it with more app, more features such as the database and uh, the camera and such. I'm gonna pull up um, I'm gonna pull up a, a little drawing program here. It might be better to to do it here than trying to draw it on the board. What I'm going to do is brainstorm a little bit. What we're going to do is think about, let's say, we have something that we're working toward. <coughs> but if we had no idea of what we were going to work on, this would be an important step to do early on. Rather than jumping straight into our code editor um, and start coding, it's often better, of course, to plan a little bit. This can be done many ways. This can be done on you know, graph paper, on a napkin, in Photoshop, in Word, in Paint, or whatever. On a whiteboard, on post-it pads, you know, uh, post-it notepads. But thinking of an idea of what we are trying to accomplish for our app before diving straight into uh, creating this project. So this project has um, content screens, a uh, home screen, art screen, computer screen. It has three big home screens, 
or three big screens of content. So if uh, this always gives me the excuse for me to break out my cool $5,000 pen here and um, do a little drawing. So let's say our hierarchy is that we have uh, a screen that points to another screen that points to another screen. All right, we've got this home screen at the top. The home screen is going off into an art screen. So we have we have an art screen. We have a computer's screen. Are those the only content areas? If you have the if you have the project up, are those the only content areas that that you see that I've outlined here? You should see that over on the computers screen. I can click to see more content screens, basic computers, intermediate computers, and eventually I'll have advanced computer classes. So this means there will be uh, basic, intermediate, advanced screens, subscreens of the computer screen. I can only reach these three screens from the computer screen. The reason I'm drawing it out and such is for us to start to think about our information architecture, which is just a fancy way of saying no layout and such, organization. I cannot get to the advanced computer screen anywhere else besides first going to the computer screen. Basic things like that are things that we need to think about. Over on the art screen, I have this art calendar that's extra information there that appears. So we would have uh, the calendar. It might not be a screen like the other ones, but it's extra content that is not visible right away. All of these that are within these little boxes, I would count as the same info, just for the main screen in this case. Then, have you clicked on STCE Catalog? That should open a brand new screen going off to the college's website. So in that case, that's a link going off to the cloud, off to the internet. Really ugly cloud. But that is the internet. So some online resource. Um, it's going off to the web. It's going off to some website. If I were developing the next great app, and I'm putting my ideas out, this is one way that I could be doing it. Writing it all down like this, I could be part of a team, figuring it all out, writing it on notepad, uh, on post-it notes, putting it up on a whiteboard, and saying, well, it might be easier to get to this screen if you first get to this screen. You know, figuring this stuff out. This is already uh, an idea that we're going towards, so we're just going to kind of reverse engineer what's here. But if you were going to make your own app, this is something that you need to think about and figure out before you open up Notepad and start coding. Are there any other relevant screens then that we uh, can get to? That information. There's a little info button down there. If you open that info, that opens another screen. Uh, info. From here it goes over to an input box. Customize. It's asking for input. And then from here, that info screen is another screen, which is the map. Get directions. So 
So this is a wireframe. This is a breakdown of, of our project wireframe. Very simple drawing about the different screens of our project. It is very helpful to engage in sort of this preliminary work before starting to do any sort of project. You may see, well, this is no longer as feasible as I thought. Or perhaps we need to be able to get to the map screen from any other spot. Maybe I want to have in the corner of every screen an icon always about, you know, map. So then I could draw lines to signify you'll be able to get to this screen from all screens. To further uh, to further make it obvious, you are able to go between these two screens, aren't you? If I'm on the art screen, I can go to the computers or back to home. So that's a little more complete. The arrows are showing I can go to these, back and forth and such. I can further add arrows in a one-way direction and such. In this wireframe here, I have my general idea of what the project is going to be. If we take a step back, however, remember that I said if you go to the project on a mobile device, you get one thing. On a desktop device, you get something else. Because actually, there's a step zero behind before what I just drew here. And part of planning also is planning to have a larger sheet of paper. So all of this uh, could be inside of something else, another folder, for example. All of this project is self-contained the mobile the mobile friendly version. The mobile friendly version is there. And so what will happen before that, we're going to have um, some screen before that that will choose that will uh, that will detect and send people either to the mobile version or the desktop version because remember the end of, the end result of this course is the is is the web version of our project. Next month we're going to then make it an app. So uh, here we need to have some sort of detection happening uh, in order for it to do this. This gets us into that we have two big schools of thought on how to do this. We have either the method of RWD or AWD. RWD. Have any of you perhaps heard of that? Responsive web design. And there's AWD, Adaptive Web Design.
We have RWD or AWD potential paradigms. Uh, adaptive was, I believe, was the earlier one, and responsive is the later one, and responsive is the more popular one. It's the one that is often taught most often nowadays, in that you create a project that will then grow and shrink, respond to the user. I develop a web project that will grow or shrink it, will respond and shrink down to the size of this device. Or if they come to it on a tablet, it will respond and grow and fill up the tablet's space. That's responsive web design. This, what I've just drawn up here, that's adaptive web design. Some mechanism will detect what the user needs and show them what they need to see. Behind the scenes, there's a big difference. For the user, there's not much difference. Behind the scenes, the user is going to get a version of the project with all of its pages and graphics and everything specifically crafted for them. Behind the scenes, a desktop user will get a version crafted for them. They both have their pros and cons. We're going to focus on the adaptive web design of it because ultimately our project is going to be for mobile. Um, we're not really going to be targeting desktop. We're going for mobile. So we're going to focus on creating a mobile version, a mobile friendly version of our project, which will adapt to the various sizes of mobile devices, yes. But our app is not going to be that much focused for desktop users. It's going to be a mobile app. So either way of these is fine if you get the end result. We're going to use adaptive web design in our project. We're not going to focus very much on the desktop version. We're going to focus on the mobile. So it's not, it's not work like we're going to do the work double. We're only going to do the work once because we're focusing on mobile. But yes, if this was going to be a full-fledged project for the web, for all devices, I would um, have to think about both of those uh, viewers. Any questions on that so far? This is our idea of the general concept. Let's get a little bit more specific here. Open a new new file. I'm going to make these drawings available in the network folder a little bit later if you want them. But based on the project that we have here, at this early stage, it also behooves us to think about, to a little bit of an extent, some layout. Not exactly all nuances of the design, but general layouts of the project. On the home screen, on the home screen, I have a particular layout. Where I have, you know, a screen, and at the top I have an element, at the bottom I have an element. I have a footer at the bottom. At the top, I have a header. In the middle, I have content. We'll call that layout A. Because we see layout A in the art screen and in the computer screen. Header area, footer area, content area. Is that the only kind of design we see throughout the project? If we go over to the computer classes, I see a header and a content area, but no footer. And actually, the header is different as well here. So let's refine this. Not only does this have a header, but it also has a, um, a nav 
a nav bar. It has a nav bar. It has buttons at the top that we see from screen to screen, as opposed to this, which doesn't. So that sort of layout has a header, no footer, and a content area. That'll be our layout B. There's a different layout that we need to create. A and B. As you browse the app, is there any, are there any more layouts? These others look the same, so are there any more layouts? You should see that if you go back to the info screen, that looks like layout B, but what's the difference about it? Layout C is a pop-up. Maybe I'll draw it slightly different like this, rounded corners perhaps. It does have a, uh, a header, and it has a close button. And it has the content area, layout C. We don't use that too many times in this project, but we could. If we break it down to layouts A, B, and C, that, those are the building blocks for any number of kinds of apps. What you put into the C, into the content, that's the part up to you. I'm going to show you all of these concepts and techniques and codes and, and, and tips and all of that, and, and how to activate features and all of that. I can show you all of that, but it's still going to be your idea that you bring to life. A, B, and C. And we have also a Get Directions screen. Is that a new kind of layout, or is it an existing layout? I think it's existing. I think that's the same as, as B. It has the header, no footer, and content. So there's another place we're using the B layout. There's sort of a pseudo D layout, our calendar. It's a side panel. It's a side panel. Maybe we'll try it something like this. This one has no header, no footer, it's all content mm, with a close button. D. So we have all of these layouts. App screen layouts. This is all uh, preliminary stuff, but very valuable to do. Um, everyone does this, especially those working on an app. We can go look up online what was the very first Twitter idea. And it was literally a napkin. The people behind Twitter were at some cafe. They started to have ideas. They got out a napkin, and they started to sketch ideas and write it all down. And that napkin is immortalized somewhere in the, like the About screen of Twitter. It started off of a napkin. Now, 10 years later, it's one of the biggest networks, one of the most valuable networks out there, this communications tool. It started on a napkin. Many stories start like that as well. So I think for this, up to this point here, this is a pretty good amount of theoretical stuff. Um, as I said, I'm going to put those in the network folder a little bit later, but any, any questions on anything that we've talked about so far? The D was the was the side panel right here. When when you're on this screen and you open the side panel. Question. So on this screen, one page, single page application, all these layout, or separate HTML? All of these we will 
we will do this as an SPA, a single page app. So yes, all of these screens and layouts will be in one document and most likely often yes as a section. Some of the other ones, uh, some of them won't exactly be a section like this one. It's a side panel. I think that one is a tag we haven't talked about yet, which is an aside. Uh, I think that one's a section. That one might be an article. You have to follow in one document with the appropriate tags. Right, any other any other questions? Yes. <coughs> you have to when you're in Google Chrome, you have to then press F12 on the keyboard, and then when that loads up, F12, you're then going to hit the icon on the top right corner here with a little sort of like devices, and that'll pull it up. All right, so we have a we have a plan, we have various concepts, we have this goal that we're going to refer to, and for the purposes of a class, we need something like this. But for yourself, um, you don't have to have this kind of plan here. But you're going to be kind of rudder rudderless if you simply dive into your code editor and start coding. What are you going to end up with? It may work, it may not. Uh, but we have a plan, so we're going to work toward creating something like this. Now we have to decide. Do we want to reinvent the wheel, or do we want to make it a little easier on ourselves? We have a lot to do. Do we want to spend the time to write all of that basic code again? Did we save, did you save a copy of your work before you started to add a lot to it? Probably not. So let's say I don't want to start all over with my code again. Whatever we've done on the previous days, it might be more trouble to kind of start with that and repurpose it than to start anew. We're going to start one more time, but we're not going to start with writing the code again. We've done that three times already. We're going to look at now some this other solution. Making mobile, uh, mobile friendly sites, making apps is becoming such a lucrative business that various companies have come out there to create uh, tools for us to do this faster. There's a lot of them out there. Um, I'll mention one that we're going to focus on and then others that you could think about looking into because there's so many ways to do this. Let's go to this website, codiqa.com. I've never heard it pronounced. I'm going to assume it's called Kodika. It could be Kodika, Kodika, I don't know. I'm going to call it Kodika. C-O-D-I-Q-A dot com. As I'm searching now, I'll notice it's saying Kodika competitors. You may want to look at that at some point because there's lots of competitors in this space. <coughs> lots of competitors in this space, but I'm going to, let's go look at Kodika dot com. Kodika says, build jQuery mobile apps the easy way. Kodika is a powerful drag and drop builder for creating cross-platform HTML5 mobile apps and websites. It's simple, easy to use, and so darn useful. And so what we're seeing here is someone is working on their computer, and they're dragging an element into the design, and hey, that looks like jQuery Mobile. It is. What we type manually, we can do with a drag-and-drop editor. Now here again, both ways are obviously perfectly leg legitimate. Do I want to roll up my sleeves, open my code editor, and write it all? And a lot of us will say, yeah, I love that. I love the code. I love the challenge. And some of us will say, no, I have an idea and I need to get it out. I don't have the time to write every single line of code. The cool thing about this is, yes, it will do it for you, but it's still code underneath it, and you can always access the code and change it. Maybe it'll be faster to edit the code than find the button that you need to get it to do what you need it to do. Let's look at this. Click Try the Demo. The screen here, it's really small, but try the demo. This is demo mode. Yeah, start the demo. This is a device in the middle. There are these different elements that you can click on. You can click on the elements, see properties. You have these widgets. You have different pages at the left, home, examples, platform. Let's say here, 
on the left side pages. Let's click on the little plus sign right there to create a new page just so that we have something blank to look at. On the left side, click new page. Now we'll just call this test. You get a blank document. From the left, I can drag a header. It gives me a header. I can drag a footer. Get a footer. I can click those things that I've added. I can change some things to the right. Instead of it saying footer, you know, copyright. Don't get too complex here just yet. I'm just showing you what we've got. And everything that we're doing here then, if you look on the bottom right corner, code. We've done some drag and drop stuff, which is very quick and useful. But click on code, and behind the scenes, data roll page, data roll content, data roll tab bar. We haven't talked about that one. Data icon, data transition fade. So it's writing the jQuery mode code that we started to to learn previously, but here it's giving it to us very very quickly. This is our HTML view, our CSS view, our JavaScript view. So let's say I'm making a great app. I'm dra dragging nav bars and adding all of these buttons. So don't worry about exactly what I'm doing. I'm just kind of putting a bunch of stuff here. Let's say I'm clicking buttons, I'm adding an icon of bars, whatever. So let's say I'm using it. I'm building an app. I have, oh, add an image, add a map, add a YouTube video, etc. It's very cool. It's very drag and drop. This is not the only one out there. There's other solutions out there. This one it lets you quickly create jQuery mobile apps. I mean, designs. What you put into it is still up to you. Um, what you, how you create it and make it dynamic and connect to your database and all of that is still up to you. How you program it to take a photo and display it on the user's layout screen, that's still all up to you. This is just, you know, do you want to build it from scratch again, or do you want to get to work? Um, both ways are viable. Let's say, okay, this is cool. I have a lot of ideas. At the top left corner, we have a little download button. I can download it as a zip, all my code. Click on that. This is the demo. You love it. Now see the pricing. This is not free. This is not free. Okay, it sounds kind of cool. What's the price? I'm going to go look at the price. See the pricing. Pricing. We have the desktop version. We have the web version. The desktop version is that you download it onto your computer and you use it on your computer. The web version, of course, is you create an account and then you're able to sign in from any computer and work on your project. Let's see, prices, it claimed prices, where are the prices? Now, yes, you're probably seeing some things about Ionic and all of that. Oh, here it is. Start at $79 per license. That's a really good price, actually. Software nowadays, it used to be very expensive initial investment. Photoshop, for example easily $500. Flash, Dreamweaver, all of that stuff, $400. Uh, but now so much software is moving over to uh, a subscription model. You can't buy Photoshop for $500 anymore. Now you can buy it for $29 per month. And every month you're paying and paying and paying and eventually you paid more than $500. But the draw of that supposedly, and you can tell possibly that I'm cynical, the draw of that possibly is that uh, you're paying on a regular basis, but you're getting the latest version right away. You're, you're never behind on your version of the software with this license. I personally don't like the subscription models, but they're, they're here. Adobe doesn't sell the old versions of Photoshop anymore with one low price. You have to do the subscription, to my knowledge. So here, a $700 one-time fee is not so bad at all. The web version is the one that costs some amount every month and you should start to see as we see here Kodika is now Ionic Creator. These guys had other competition 
But these guys seemed to be the ones that really did it well, that then they got bought. And isn't that always the end result of any tech startup? To get bought out. So they got bought, and now they're Ionic Creator. Let's briefly check that. Start building your app. Same sort of thing. Drag and drop, etc. Great. What's the price? Here we go. They've got the zero dollars a month for one project, the pro version, twenty-four dollars a month for five projects, a team, eighty-nine a month for uh, unlimited projects, and the enterprise. Don't ask. I mean, contact us. So yeah, the zero dollar one is good, and you have to work on one project and get all of its features. It's one project, and there's ways around that. I don't want to mention them, of course. I don't want to take money out of their pockets, but. These are the various prices. Annual billing is this. Monthly billing is more expensive. This is one of many tools out there that lets you do this. Create these mobile friendly projects quickly. And this is this is this is a good one. Uh, it's got the latest code and standards and features. The confusing part about then having to teach this is there's still the legacy Codica and then there's a new modern creator, Ionic creator. And the thing is there that um, any tool that you use is the right tool if it does what you need it to do. For this class we're going to use Codica and there is a version, yes there's the seven day free trial, but it's going to get annoying to download it every time and install it every time and have it expire every time. There's a version of Kodika, because I've been teaching this for a few years. They had a version that was completely for free, that you can download your code and work on it at your leisure on Notepad. Uh, they've they've uh, sort of hidden that version because they want you to get their, their paid their paid versions. So I was teaching this class for a few years. Then one day I was prepping the semester and I checked all my links and such. I went to Kodika and now, oh, they're selling Kodika now. And, I, and I've got to teach this in a few days. What, what am I going to do? I reached out to them on Twitter and they answered me. And they said, okay, for educational purposes, let me give you this link for your students where it's the totally free version where I can download my code, where your students can download your code. So that link, I don't have it memorized, but you can get it here. Go to delicious.com slash vmcampos. Have you heard of delicious.com before? Delicious.com is a uh, bookmark saving site. You're on your home computer, you're using your web browser, you find a cool site, you save it to your bookmarks or your favorites, whatever it calls it. You save your bookmark on your home computer. Then you go anywhere else, you didn't bring your computer, you don't have your, your bookmark saved. Delicious.com, create a free account there, save your bookmarks there, and then you can access them and share them from any computer. And yes, more of these browsers nowadays have a built-in bookmarking sharing feature kind of thing. But uh, I've used this one for years, and I like it. And I've accumulated like 400, 400 links that people might find useful. So somewhere here, I forgot to check where, oh, up on the top, search VM Campos. Go to the top. Should say search VM Campos. If it doesn't, go to my address first, which is delicious. dot com vm campos and in the top search box search codica c i d i q a right here search vm campos codica and you should get a result that's called codica prototypes there's the address ultimately codica dot com slash embed slash editor that's the one that we're, that we're going to use for this class. It's the free educational version of Kodika. 
most importantly, we are able to download our code because we're not going to, to use the actual Codica editor a lot. We're going to use it to lay out a general layout. We have an idea that we need to create screen A, B, and C. We have a general idea that we need a home screen and about screen, whatever. We're going to create the general skeleton of the project in Codica.com and then download it and get back into Notepad the rest of the time. So did everyone find that Codica prototype link? Go ahead and click on it. So it's a, it's a slightly different version of the one that they're selling, but it still will let us do what we want to do here. And um, you've got all of the different, or most of the different widgets of jQuery up at the top. All on the top row, or you can say show me the toolbar types of widgets, the button widgets, content, list views, forms. So the way we're going to use this is we're going to borrow basically most of the widgets. We're going to just drop them all into this layout. I just wanted to give me all of the example code. We're then going to download it and then start to use it for our project. Because we could write the code for all of these widgets. And that is useful for learning it, for learning the core hard, learning the code hardcore. But I have an idea that I want to make an app, and I want to get to it as fast as I can. So what we'll do is go ahead and drag a page header widget. Don't worry too much again at the moment about customizing any of this, because what could happen is you're doing all of this hard work, and then you accidentally press back on the browser or reload. You're going to lose it all. There's no save here. If you do get the Kodika, the Kodika saved, I mean, if you do get the Kodika plan, if you buy it, you will be able to save your work, of course. This is the prototype. This is the educational purpose one. You're going to lose it if you go away from this page. So don't worry about getting all of this customization yet. Drag a header widget, and then drag a navbar widget, be careful here because you can drag the navbar out here. I don't want it there. I want the navbar in the header. Remember, we made a navbar ourselves by hand. We wrote OL data roll navbar, I think. No, we did nav data roll equals navbar. And then we made an OL and list items. Well, here we're doing it with some drag and drop. Drag your navbar here. It doesn't look like a navbar yet because you need to add more buttons to it. And add two more buttons. So you should see on the right side the various properties of the element that you dragged. I dragged a navbar and it says you're editing the navbar. Go ahead and add two new buttons. properties of each of the buttons. Just for the moment, I'll call one home again. I'm not going to fully set this all up here. I could lose it. But just to show you, we've got home, initially active. I don't know what that is. If I turn it on, oh, I see initially active. What that does is it like makes the button highlighted as if I've clicked on it. You see that often when you go from screen to screen of a website or an app. To tell you what screen you're on, this is one little bit of user feedback. If I inspect code at the bottom right, it tells me that what I did was I added class, UI button active, UI state persist. So that, I would have eventually learned how to do that when I went over to the jQuery mobile website and read the whole manual, sure. Or I learned that by looking at the element here in Codica, and then inspect code. I'll just drop in one icon. There's a home icon. That's fine. I'm just getting these pieces so that it gives me the generic code so that we, then we can download it and make something better. I'm going to 
drag a heading here and be careful because you could accidentally drag the heading in the header. I don't want that yet. And I want it down here in the body. You drop in a picture, drop in a map. Just gonna borrow all of these widgets. And this map is not gonna be a very good map. The one we're gonna create later later is better. But at the very least, we can do something like this where it uh It can um, actually have a kind of real location. It's not dynamic or anything cool like that yet. This is the picture. But maybe just to examine its code later, it might be nice to bring it in. Link is really dumb. Don't even bother with that one. Heading collapsible. That's a very good one. Drag a collapsible widget down here. And the way this one works is that it opens and closes to reveal more content, like a drawer. This is a content drawer. I'm going to add a few sections to it. So this will open and close. Right now I'm just dragging and dropping all of these pieces later on. This version of Kodika does not let me create more than one screen. I want a home screen, computer screen, art screen. It won't let me do that. We'll have to do that ourselves or you're going to need to pay for the full version. And so this is actually going to be over in the art screen, but we'll drop it into the home screen just so that we see what its code looks like and we can understand it and then apply it. I'll drag a list view item next down here somewhere, and another one here. I'm accidentally about to put the list item list view into the collapsible. Be careful there. This one is made out of dividers and buttons. I can add a new button. I can add a new divider. This one's kind of cool because all of these can be buttons, different elements. It can have some text here. We can figure out how to make that be dynamic to change later. I'm just kind of playing with these different things, selecting some options. Uh, I'm going to drag down here a grid. This one's cool. This grid lets us divide up our screen into various rows and columns. I'm going to do two by two. So here we'll be able to have a grid, four items there, maybe some buttons and such. We can make more of them, columns and rows. Don't worry about ID and class at the moment. And, I'll, and also for the moment, don't worry about any of these form elements just yet. I'm not going to select any of them just yet. Uh, ultimately, we are going to create a much better contact form. Uh, and the ability also to share to social media, the ability to send an email to the developer, for example, tech support. So those form elements, I'm going to skip them. You can drag them in there if you want them. I'm not going to use them. And finally, at the bottom of the document of the project, I'm going to drag in a footer. Just take a moment uh, to grab some of these pieces. We're going to download it in just a moment. But put some pieces in here. Maybe inspect the code for a moment. We're going to download it together and see what we, what we have with it and move up with it. Did everyone get a chance to get the sign-in sheet?
All right, so I forgot to mention at the top right corner you do have a test button that mm -hmm. you, can, you can turn on, and it's not that impressive. You've got build and test at the top right. But I just put some things in. I'm not going to make this very complex yet. Again, this is not the place for it. Notepad is the place where we're going to do the heavy lifting. Here I just want these pieces of example code. So I dragged everything in here. Before anything happens to your masterpiece, make sure at the top right corner when it's about done, click Download HTML. So at the top right corner, click that. It should download. It'll say Kodika app dash whatever. You'll get your version of the code. So you want to drag that. Uh, I mean, you want to then extract it. It got saved to my desktop, so if I click it, it opens it up, and it says there I've got... I've downloaded its mobile website and it brought it down with all the pieces. So whatever you're doing, if you don't have everything set up just yet, we need to move on. So at the top right corner, hit that download HTML. And then when it downloads, see mine downloaded to the desktop. It's right there, Kodika app, whatever, dot zip. You want to right click the zip file, don't just open it up, don't double click it, you want to right click the zip file and select at the top extract all. You need to unzip it. It's zipped up, it's compressed because it's several pieces that it gave us actually. So click extract all. Let's we'll say where would you like to extract it, so just extract it anywhere. I'm going to put it on my flash drive. Extracted it to my flash drive. And it gave me a folder mobile website. So we'll we'll look at all of the things that it gave us and we'll look at the code and we'll work with it in just a moment, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So wherever you're at, make sure you've downloaded this. Call me over if you need a little help. We want to get to this point where we've downloaded it, extracted it, and now we're going to get into Notepad, and we're going to go on. So, um, and you need a little help getting to this point.
Uh, all right, so we, we should all have a copy of that code downloaded. Let's take a look at what we got. Um, so it's, it's downloaded, and it's, it gave me three things. Index HTML, so my, uh, my, uh, my content layer, the structure. It gave me codica.external.css, which is the presentation layer, the design. And then it gave me codica.external.js, the interactive layer. So it separated all three of those for me pretty nice. So I'm going to write all my custom CSS, my custom JavaScript in their own file, and then the main content and structure in the HTML file. Great. Let's first look at this CSS file. Now, we're going to need to pay attention, of course, .css.js. Icons are different here, but depending on your system, they may be the same. It's going to be very easy. I see it happen oftentimes when I teach this. I say, let's go into our JavaScript file and write this JavaScript. And someone writes it, but they wrote it in their CSS file, and it didn't work. So just make sure you're in the right file when I say, let's edit the CSS, let's edit the JavaScript. Now we've got a separate file to deal with. That was one of the cons, one of the negatives of doing this, which is external. Remember, we've got inline embedded external. JavaScript or CSS. This is now external. Now we need to keep track of which one are we working with. I want to open Kodika external.css in Notepad++. Right-click it, and because we've got Notepad++ installed, it's right there. We could go to, we could open Notepad++ first, and then go to File, Open, and find this file. Sure. Or the file's right there, so I'll right-click it, Edit with Notepad++. Not a very impressive file. It just says, put your CSS here. You notice it doesn't require anything extra here. When we're writing our HTML code, we need the doc type, and we need the body tag, and all of that. But a CSS file is just full of CSS. No character encoding or anything like that. So if we wanted to do something like, don't do this yet, but if we did body, background color, we just write the selector and the proper property and value, and that's all what a CSS file would need. It doesn't need, remember, in the HTML file, we had to create the style tag, style pair, and write our style. This, don't do this. Don't put your style tags in a CSS file. It's a CSS file. They're assumed. Here we would just write our CSS, um, you know, IDs or classes or tags or whatever. So I'm not writing anything yet, I'm just freestyling. But I'm showing here, we're going to write our CSS code here. If I um, go back to the folder, let's open the Kodika JS file. And actually, if you drag and drop into Notepad, it opens it also, another shortcut. So if you've got Notepad open somewhere, and you just drag a file into Notepad, it'll also open it. Again, nothing here. Put your custom code here. We're going to put our custom JavaScript code here. This is also the same in that over on the HTML file, we needed a script. Uh, we needed a uh, did I say that wrong a moment ago? We needed a script tag here, but we needed a... Did I say style or script a moment ago? Style. Okay, hopefully I said style. We need the style tag for the CSS code in our HTML file. We would need the script tag for our script JavaScript code in the HTML file. But in a JavaScript file, not needed. The whole thing is assumed to be script, JavaScript. When we do all of our document dot get element by id blah blah blah, all of that's going to be in this file. So nothing very impressive in these two. It's up to us. All right, now let's look at the index HTML file. Now we've got something. <coughs> now I've got something to work with. And in my case, it gave me 123 lines of code. You may have more or less, doesn't matter. But it gave me 
everything here. Run Firefox. Let's let's do this. Open your index, run Firefox. If you if you use Chrome, just run Firefox for a moment. Run Firefox because Firefox also has one of these sort of like uh, mobile device emulator things built in. I think the Chrome one's a little better. But let's compare it. Open up open up the web project in Chrome and notice it doesn't look very cool here on a big old desktop. We're not aiming for a desktop. We haven't programmed AWD yet. It doesn't quite look the best here. This should be a mobile device. I'm in Firefox. Hit F12. Firefox's mobile device emulator is down here. Responsive design mode. Uh, fourth icon from the right. Responsive design mode. Doesn't look like anything like I would have thought it is, but I guess it's supposed to be a square responding to a larger square screen. So hit that one. And also, I want this panel. Mine is on the bottom. I want this panel on the right side, like on Chrome. You can move it to the right side with this icon right here. Dock to side of browser window. It's on the side. Doesn't matter if it goes there or not, but it's better because then I can see the project tall like a device. So Firefox and Chrome both have these things, just different icons and placements and such. But there's the responsive design. And this one doesn't have any device definitions. It just has dimensions, which is not as helpful. So that, is that the size of an iPhone? I don't know. It doesn't say. Is this the size of an iPad? Maybe. The very... The, the, the default one that it had is okay, but I, I don't get a full sense of it. And that's okay, because this is, we're going to deal with these things. That jQuery Mobile built in is going to squash and stretch to accommodate pretty well a screen. So I have my, my pieces here. Going back to Notepad. We're going to break down everything that we got here in just a moment. We're going to take our first break. So in my case, it gave me 123 lines. If you'd like exactly what I created, I put it into the network folder. If you, if you want what I did and want to work exactly with what I did during the break, you could go over to the network folder, Campus Android 1, and I have a folder in there with today's date, temp, and all of my code that I ended up with the end of the day I'll put my code of what I end up with so every time we finish our code because we're not going to start over from this point anymore we're going to take this to fruition so I'm going to put my code as I end up with it at the end of the day with a folder with to, with the day's date so you'll always be able to get a copy of my code at the end of the day if you want to compare or some, something didn't quite work you can see perhaps what you did wrong let's take a break we'll be back at 7:35 and we'll we'll see what do we have to work with and then how we have to shape it and work with it